Good morning. Four more years. Health care reform is no longer an unmet promise. It is the law of the land. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. The majority of those who died today were children, beautiful little kids between the ages of five and ten years old. We know in our hearts that for the United States of America, the best is yet to come. President Barack Obama, the 44th president, takes the oath of office to serve a second term. And we're here for all the tradition, pageantry, and celebration today, Monday, January 21st, 2013. From NBC News, this is a special edition of Today, the second inauguration of Barack Obama with Matt Lauer and Savannah Guthrie, live from Washington, D.C. And good Monday morning to you, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of today on a Monday morning from Capitol Hill. As you looked at the White House there, now the Capitol. I'm Matt Lauer alongside Savannah Guthrie, Natalie Morales, and Mr. Al Roker. A beautiful sunrise here in Washington. No matter who you voted for, this is a historic day for the country. A little cloudy and cold here in the nation's capital, but hundreds of thousands of people from all over the country are already starting to gather along the parade route this morning. The president and his family have a very full day ahead. So do we here at NBC News. Starts off 845 Eastern. At least the celebration does. The Obamas and the Bidens will attend a private prayer service at St. John's Church. From there, it's back to the White House for a 10 o'clock coffee with some congressional leaders. If you could be a fly on the wall, that might be the event to attend this morning. Indeed. At 1040 Eastern, the first family will start making their way toward the Capitol. The inauguration ceremony begins at 1130 Eastern with the president's public swearing in at 1155, followed, of course, by his inaugural address. This will actually be President Obama's fourth time taking the oath. He took it, of course, on Sunday during a quiet ceremony at the White House that fulfills the constitutional obligation to be sworn in on January 20th by noon. Four years ago, though, you may remember the oath was botched a bit on the Capitol steps, so the President and Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts had to redo it again later at the White House. That brings us up to four after today. Exactly. I like the way you say it was just botched. You don't point a finger of blame at either one <laughs> of them. Not on a day like this. No. By the way, some big stars will take part in the festival today. Beyonce, James Taylor and Kelly Clarkson will all be performing during the celebration and following a luncheon inside the Capitol, the inaugural parade down Pennsylvania Avenue will kick off at about 2.30 this afternoon. We're going to have more on the pageantry of the day and what the president will be facing over the next four years coming up. Plus, a lot of people are curious to see, of course, what the first lady will be wearing again today. And already she's made a big change. Her new bangs getting a lot of attention as well. The president has finally weighed in on that new do, and we're going to tell you what he thinks about it. He's a smart man, are, though. Yeah, I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah, come on. Really? Like he yeah. might say something bad? I don't think so. On a different note, football fans in this area have another reason to be really excited this morning. The Baltimore Ravens headed to the Super Bowl to take on the San Francisco 49ers. Head coaches, brothers, John and Jim Harbaugh going at each other. A first for the big game. We're going to have more on that as well. Man, what a collapse in that second half. Oh, you the just Har-ball. made a lot of friends. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, just cratered. Yeah, exactly. They are calling it the Har Bowl coming right. up. Let us start, though, with the inaugural events here in the nation's capital. NBC's chief White House correspondent is Chuck Todd, and he's at the White House. Chuck, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. Well, as Savannah was pointing out, the president was officially sworn in yesterday. He does a ceremonial swearing in later today, fourth time matching FDR as a president who will have taken the oath four times. Here's the reason why there are two swearing-ins. The Constitution says January 20th, and any time it has fallen on a Sunday, there has been this decision to hold the public ceremony the next day. It's a precedent that was started by James Monroe. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. President Obama's second term is already underway this morning. The president taking the oath of office Sunday in a 32-second private ceremony led by Chief Justice John Roberts. Good job, Dan. I did it. You're doing 
That comment from the president's daughter, right. Sasha, a reminder of Chief Justice Roberts' I flub Rock four years ago. Obama. That I will execute the office of president to the United States faithfully. That I will execute. That, of course, led to the president retaking the oath the following day. This time around, Roberts stuck to the script. Vice President Biden was also officially sworn in Sunday by Justice Sonia Sotomayor. The president's second inaugural address is expected to echo themes from his first, especially the divisive politics of Washington. We come to proclaim an end to the petty grievances. But Mr. Obama's advisors say he's also prepared to take a more realistic approach. We're going to do a better job in the second term of while we're going to do all we can uh, to work with Congress and negotiate to also make sure the American people are more connected to what's going on here. For the first and second families, a jam-packed inauguration weekend from Saturday's National Day of Service to the First Lady's appearance at a children's inaugural ball to a wreath laying at Arlington National Cemetery to a Sunday night inaugural reception. What we're doing is celebrating each other and celebrating this incredible nation that we call home. Today's address, Matt, is going to be focused on uplifting things like democracy, like unity. He isn't going to do a laundry list. Don't forget, in just three weeks, he's got the State of the Union. That's the place to do that. You know, Chuck, I was listening to his 2009 inaugural address on the radio last night. And in it, yeah. he talked about doing away with petty politics, with divisive politics, uh, showing yeah. the American people that their government could work for them again. A lot of those things did not happen in the last four years. Do you think he might acknowledge the shortcomings? Well, I'm told he is going to try to acknowledge it, but at the same time, be a little more realistic. Uh, I think one of the uh, uh, phrases being used is pragmatic hope if you will. It's not the same uh, uh, hope and change, not the same expectations that were set four years ago. Uh, some realism, but at the same time, realizing that actually the country wants this. We saw it in our own poll, Matt, the NBC Wall Street Journal poll, the number one message that uh, folks wanted to send, particularly to Congress, was work together, yeah. compromise. All right, Chuck Todd at the White House. Chuck, we're going to be with you a lot today. Thank you very you much. It. NBC's Willie Geist is here as well. He's along the parade route at the U.S. Navy Memorial. Willie, did nobody tell you the parade doesn't start for seven and a half hours? <laughs> well, Matt, the gates aren't even open yet. The crowds are waiting outside. They don't come in until 730. So, yeah, we did get here a little bit early. In terms of that crowd, the Department of Homeland Security expecting somewhere between 500 to 700,000 people this go around. Remember, four years ago, there were 1.8 million people along this road. 500 to 700,000, nothing to sniff at, but when you compare it to four years ago, quite a bit smaller. Now, just to orient you a little bit, this is the United States Navy Memorial. I'm about halfway along the 1.2 mile route to travel from the United States Capitol to the White House behind me. We're going to see the president twice along here today. After he has coffee with congressional leadership at the White House, he will zip past us here with his motorcade to go up and get inaugurated. And then around 2.30 Eastern time after that lunch, the parade comes this way back toward the White House. So we're going to see him a couple of times. In terms of weather, Matt, about mid 40s is what we're hearing. Al's going to have more on that. So not a terribly cold day out here. It should be nice. We can point out the only time this event was canceled because of weather was in 1985 when it was about seven degrees, snowy, icy. Ronald Reagan decided to stay inside and not hold the parade. So today the weather looks good. It's crisp. The show will go on, Matt. Yeah, far cry from that. Willie, we'll check in with you a lot during the morning as well. Thank you very much. NBC's Lester Holt is also here. He's on Capitol Hill somewhere behind me. Lester, good morning to you. Hey, Matt, good morning. We've got a great view behind me. The platform where the president will be sworn in and deliver his inaugural address. That 10,000 square foot platform will be filled with members of the House and Senate, the Supreme Court, the uh, uh, members of the, uh, the cabinet, along with the uh, uh, diplomatic corps and others. The whole program gets Gets underway at 11:30. It should last about an hour and a half. There will be musical performances, as we noted. Uh, James Taylor, Kelly Clarkson, and Beyonce, who will sing the national anthem at the uh, close of the ceremony. Chief Justice Roberts will administer this ceremonial oath. The president will use two Bibles: the Lincoln Bible, also the Traveling Bible that was owned by uh, the Reverend Martin, L Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose uh, birthday we celebrate today. In that speech, we're told the president will talk about the need to seek common. Ground. After the inauguration, he will retire inside with uh, 
Members of the congressional leadership for the traditional luncheon at Statuary Hall before uh, kicking off uh, the inaugural parade down Pennsylvania Avenue. And by the way, on the menu, Matt, uh, for that luncheon, steamed lobster, bison, and apple pie for dessert. <laughs> All right, Lester, thank you. David Axelrod was the president's senior campaign advisor. David, good morning. It's good to see good you. Good to see you. I had one advisor tell me this is an inaugural speech that is forceful. How would you describe it? What's the president's Well, vision? I think the first thing to remember is this is not a partisan day. This is not a day for uh, one man's celebration. This is a national consecration. This is a national renewal. Uh, and so he's going to be speaking about values and principles, not so much about programs and, and prescriptions, and set a direction for the country country based on the things that unite us. Inaugural speeches are by their nature more poetry than prose. I read his first one last night. He wrote, on this day we come to proclaim an end to the petty grievances and false promises, the recriminations and worn out dogmas that for far too long have strangled our politics. Nice words. That's why you need two terms. I was, I was going to say, is there any evidence that the dynamic has changed as he described four years ago? Well, obviously we've gone through a difficult four years uh, in, in many different ways. but. Uh, the one evidence that things may be changing is that I think there's some recognition on the part of the Republican Party that the strategy of ob obstruction has been very damaging to them as well as the country. And you saw that in their retreat last week when they decided to pull back from threatening to push us over the... Uh, the, the, uh, the cliff on the death ce uh, debt ceiling. If you do talk to Republicans, they'll tell you this is a president oh, very confident from his reelection. Some might use the word cocky and that he's become more partisan and more hard nosed. Would you agree with that assessment? And is it by necessity or choice? Well, no, I don't. I think he's become he's he's practical and he understands that when the other party takes a position that they're going to oppose you on virtually every initiative, then you have to seek national support for the goals that you have, because in a democracy it's the people who push uh, policy forward not 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 the politicians and so that's a lesson that he's drawn from the first uh, term that said he's his as far as I can as I know and as I know him his door is always open to people who are willing to work together to solve problems and one hopes that in the next four years there'll be a spirit of cooperation understand that we're never going to agree on everything that's why we have two parties but in order to move the country forward we've got to work together David Axelrod always good to see good you to know see you'll be you, watching Savannah. closely today thank you. thank you we will have much more on the president's second inaugural in a moment but first let's get to Natalie Morales who's got a check of the morning's other top stories Natalie good morning again to you and good morning to you Savannah good morning everyone the death Death toll following the Algerian hostage crisis is climbing and dozens of international hostages are still unaccounted for. NBC's Keir Simmons has the latest now from London. Keir, good morning. Hey Natalie, this morning is claimed two of the dead hostage takers are Canadian nationals. The report from Algerian security sources is not confirmed, but if it's true, then this siege at a BP gas plant highlights a wider Al Qaeda threat. Bullet holes and burnt vehicles, the bloody aftermath of a siege ended by the Algerian army. At least 23 hostages killed and over 20 bodies found overnight. This video apparently shows survivors escaping into the desert with terrifying stories. You could hear gunfire outside, uh, machine gun fire. And not just machine guns. The extremists had rocket-propelled grenades, mortars, like a small army, a still unknown number of Americans among the victims. We cannot accept attacks against our citizens and our interests abroad. Recorded issuing demands for the release of prisoners, the leader of the hostage-takers, Abdul Rahman al Najiri, believed killed. North African groups aligned to al-Qaeda a new threat, say Western politicians. This is a global threat and it will require a global response. It will re require a response that is about years, even decades, rather than months. Britain Paul Morgan fought back when the attack began last week. The former French Foreign Legion soldier was head of security at the plant. He paid with his life. And NBC News has learned the British believe the attack took a long time to plan, suggesting these North African extremist groups targeting Westerners are, Natalie, increasingly organized. All right, Keir Simmons in London. Thanks so much, Keir.
Overnight, a United Express plane veered off a runway at Newark International Airport. Officials say the passenger jet from Rochester blew four tires before careening across a taxiway. It didn't strike anything and no one was injured in the incident. New findings from the federal investigation into a battery fire on board a Boeing 787 earlier this month. The government probe says the battery had not been overcharged, but the fire could have been caused by other issues with the battery's charging components as the investigation is ongoing. Going. The entire international fleet of Boeing's so-called Dreamliner has been grounded since last Wednesday after a string of issues. Mr. Roker, a little chilly here in Washington, but no rain to speak of. That's right. In fact, the president, the forecaster in chief, he said it would be warmer this time around than his last inaugural, and he is correct. Let's take a look at uh, the forecast for you. We are expecting to see plenty of uh, sunshine, although there could be some clouds later in the day, and then some snow showers. Temperatures between 33 and 40. Afternoon high getting up to 47. We got a big storm system making its way, clipper system coming across the Great Lakes. That's going to be bringing lake effect snow around the eastern Great Lakes. But by tomorrow, major snowfall setting up for southern New England and coastal New England as well. We're talking snowfall amounts about a foot or more between Cleveland and Buffalo. But look at this from Boston up into Portsmouth. We're talking anywhere from six to nine, maybe 12 inches of snow and more heavy snow back through the Great Lakes. And that's your latest weather. All right, Al. Thanks very much. President Obama's second term is technically already underway, but the road to get here was not an easy one. There were, of course, highs and lows, triumphs and tragedies in the first term, but no one could have predicted exactly how it would all unfold. In America, I have never been more hopeful. Hope and change were in the air as Barack Obama became the 44th president of the United States. We must pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and begin again the work of remaking America. Hello, everybody. In the first 100 days, a flurry of activity with the assembling of a cabinet, new legislation, and trips overseas. It's stunning to see just how far the Dow has plunged. An economy on the brink saw the passage of a stimulus bill and bailouts for banks and automakers. The typical president, I think, has two or three big problems, we've got seven or eight big problems. As he staked his presidency on the passage of health care. I'm not the first president to take up this cause, but I am determined to be the last. A year-long partisan battle <laughs> ultimately led to sweeping reform. As the next challenge swelled in the South. We're watching the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico tonight. The president fended off criticism that he wasn't acting sure fast he's... enough. We talked to these folks because they potentially had the best answers, so I know who's asked to kick. He made history with Supreme Court nominations. And with the country engaged in two wars, President Obama took action. It is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. He fired a runaway general and fulfilled a campaign promise. Tonight, I am announcing that the American combat mission in Iraq has ended. But back at home, the midterm elections brought a resounding victory for Republicans. The American people have sent an unmistakable message to him tonight. Change course. Is it possible voters can conclude you're still not getting it? I'm not recommending for every future president that they take a shellacking like I did last night. President Obama moved ahead with his domestic agenda. This morning, I am proud to sign a law that will bring an end to don't ask, don't tell. As he battled Republicans over the debt ceiling. Dealing with the White House is like dealing with a bowl of jello. Can they say yes to anything? An historic night in May brought the news that Americans had been waiting nearly a decade to hear. Tonight. I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. Within a year, he was back on the campaign trail, but on the anniversary of 9-11, a deadly terror attack in Benghazi. And make no mistake, justice will be done. After a long, tough campaign, Americans decided to give the president four more years. Thank you, America. The thrill of victory cut short by searing tragedy, a day Obama called the worst of his presidency. Our hearts are broken today. These tragedies must end. Now, at the dawn of his second term, President Obama has vowed to tackle the tough issues. There are no easy outs despite the challenges that lie ahead. We know in our hearts 
that for the United States of America, the best is yet to come. A long four years in many ways. So what will the next four years hold for President Obama? Can he overcome the challenges that many two-term presidents have faced? We will get into that. And then on a much different note, the president takes perhaps his least controversial stance on an issue in a long time as he weighs in about his wife's brand new bangs. But first, this is Today on NBC. Coming up, we will look ahead to the major issues the president will face in the next four years. And then our own Jenna Bush Hager will be here with her own memories right. of Inauguration Day's past. But first, a look at your local news and weather. Back now on this Monday morning, it is the 21st of January 2013, Inauguration Day here in Washington, D.C., and that is the view from the Capitol steps toward the Washington Monument down on the Mall. It will be filled today as people gather to see the second inaugural of President Obama. The official theme of this inaugural, Faith in America's Future, a message that resonates as this is also Martin Luther King Day today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Savannah Guthrie alongside Matt Lauer, Natalie Morales, and Al Roker. And we are on Capitol Hill as the sun rises here in Washington. Yeah, it's really pretty. It's a significant day. The president has a bust of Dr. King in his office and an original program from the March on Washington where King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. And one of the two Bibles that the president will use at today's swearing-in ceremony is Dr. King's so-called traveling Bible. The other is the Bible that Abraham Lincoln was using to be sworn in in 1861. So that's a pretty weighty it's little a day moment of there. there. All about yeah. symbolism for sure. That's right. Meanwhile, coming up as well, we're going to hear from the president's brother-in-law, Craig Robinson. He had some surprising so things to say about how the first term changed the president and his sister, the first so lady. And we are going to have the answer that everybody has been asking the question to. What does the president think of Mrs. Obama's brand new bangs? There's only one possible response for yes. him. Well, he's a very smart man. Yes. <laughs> there can only be one response. There is no upside to criticizing no. that hairdo. No. There's no question. Diplomatic. All, All right. the way. A lot to get to. Let's start with Andrea Mitchell. She is here with a look at the second term of president's past. Andrea, good morning to good you. Good morning to you. Welcome to Washington and Inauguration Day. The president has dined in the last two weeks with historians to better understand the curse that often afflicts second terms. They describe the president as very conscious of the pitfalls and opportunities as he begins his final four years in office. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. But for many of these presidents, taking the oath of office was the high point of their second term. From wars to natural disasters, from an impeachment trial, have sexual relations with that woman. To resignation. Once they win re-election, presidents can stumble. I'm more than familiar with all the literature about presidential overreach in second terms. Uh, we are very cautious about that. There is plenty of precedent. FDR, not Washington satisfied with a majority of 334 Democrats in the House and 76 Democrats the in the Senate, tried in 1936 to control the Supreme Court as well. He came up with this idea of packing the court with his own judges, didn't work, caused the Senate, which was Democratic, to be very angry at him. Ronald Reagan won re-election in a landslide, but after an ill-fated staff switch, he spent the next two years entangled in Iran-Contra, the arms for hostages scandal. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. Bill Clinton had to overcome personal scandal. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. George W. Bush's legacy was marred by Iraq and Katrina. And Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. But presidents can also overcome early setbacks, as Ronald Reagan proved in helping to end the Cold War. Mr. Gorbachev, 
tear down this wall. President Obama told Matt last year he has a lot of unfinished business. Do you deserve a second term? I deserve a second term, but we're not done. Is battle fatigue a factor? Well, there can be mistakes uh, made, and there can be uh, fatigue that sets in, but I think that uh, President Obama, from what I've seen, uh, is highly energized at this moment, does want to have a positive, leave a positive legacy. And advisors say that the president is focused on guns, immigration, energy policy, and of course the economy, but knows he has a year to at most 18 months to get things done before he is seen as a lame duck. The White House game plan is to campaign aggressively outside Washington in order to keep maximum pressure on Congress. Matt? Andrea, thank you very much. Joined by a couple of familiar faces and <laughs> David Gregory and Tom Brokaw as well. Guys, welcome to all of you. Good morning. There's a saying that the job of the president in the first term is to get a second term, so that's been mission accomplished. Now, in your opinion, David, how high will this president set his goals for the second term? How high should he? Well, I think the key is economic re restoration. He comes into office amid financial ruin in the country. I think he understands the public wants to get back to work, wants the country to grow again economically. I think everything flows from that. I think that's what we start to hear today, and that's really the mission of it's four years, but it's really much less than that when you think about it. It, it. starts with that. It starts with the fiscal responsibility, debts and spending. It goes to gun control. Control. It goes to immigration, perhaps some action on climate control. That's a very big wish list. What are the chances he gets a little piece of, any, of all of that? Well, I don't know whether he get a piece of all of that. I think what we'll know more at the end of the day is uh, as, uh, after his inaugural speech, which I, my guess is, and based on what I've been told, we'll hear a little more prose and poetry, and a lot of it will be addressed to the middle class because they are the forgotten part of the American economy in the eyes of a lot of Democrats especially. My guess is that the big theme for him in the second term, Matt, is going to be big ideas that unite the country, not the small ideas that have divided us for the past several years. And as David is right, you've got to restore the economy, and then everything flows from that. You talk about big ideas that unite the country, and last night I was saying in the open of the show, Andrea and David and Tom jump in here, that they were playing the 2009 inaugural address. And when he talked about the things like saying, on this day we put aside petty politics, on this day we put aside the politics of division, we show the people of this country that their government works for them. And yet over these last four years we've seen time and time again those things are, are firmly entrenched here. It's been so toxic that I think the president is betting that the American people, it's clear in our polls, are, the people are really fed up with this and that it will be in the Republican Party's advantage to play somewhat toward getting something done. You saw that in Williamsburg, Virginia, with the House caucus last week when Paul Ryan steered the party and the more radical elements of the Tea Party, which supported him, toward some sort of compromise short term, at least on the debt ceiling. Was it they compromise or was it just a strategy to move a, a bigger fight down the road? Well, well it's a, I think it's an indication. I think it's a telltale sign. Uh, about where, where the Republicans are. Four years ago, when the president was making that speech, Republicans were meeting at night exactly. trying to decide how they were going to defeat him when he runs for re-election. They lost that big time. He had a very robust electoral victory and a significant popular vote victory. Now the Republicans are in disarray trying to organize their party so they have a future. And they're going to have to deal with the reality of that as well. It is a party that is still broken into a lot of parts on the GOP side. And there's going to have to be a lot of mending done and then more outreach as well. A couple of key areas. This is a president who's focused on energy independence. People close to him say that could be an unlikely bipartisan legacy for President Obama and health care. Party line vote divided the country. Implementation is going to be tough. It's something he's going to have to spend a lot of time on to show results. Wasn't it seen, though, that immigration was an area where he might have the best chance of success? And I still think that's the case. Probably true. I yeah. think that is something that the Republicans know they need to focus on. Guns are going to be tough, but I think the president also feels that on issues like this, he now can take some chances, even if it's not politically popular, and it's not. He's going for the long ball as well. I know you've got a lot to talk about. Let's save a little of it because you're going to be with us throughout the entire day. Tom. Oh, my. I, I that's had true. No idea. I didn't tell you. Really? You've got to start reading your emails. I told you everything I know. You've got to read the emails. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Brokaw, David Gregory, Andrea Mitchell. Thank Folks, you, always good to spend time Thank with you. you. Let's go outside and get a check of the weather from Al. Wow, it's going to be a long day if Tom's already done. Anyway, let's take a look. What a beautiful, beautiful morning as you look at the Capitol. Okay, a little inaugural weather history. Ronald Reagan 
had the warmest inaugural ever, January 20th, 1981, cloudy skies, 55 degrees. Then four years later, he had the coldest inaugural ever at seven degrees at noon, wind chills 10 to 20 degrees below. They canceled the parade. Well, look at these wind chills up and the air temperatures up in the upper plains. Minneapolis, seven below, feels like 25 below. Green Bay, three, Minot, eight below, and the wind chills even worse. As you take a look, we'll show you we're looking at temperatures today that are in the below zero uh, readings in the plains, 20s in the northeast. By tomorrow, those temperatures, that cold, bitter cold air makes its way into the mid-Atlantic Atlantic states all the way down to the south. And that's your latest weather. Matt? All right, Al, thank you very much. Still ahead, Jenna Bush Hager will be here to share her favorite memories from her family's inaugurals. But up next, the First Lady's brother opens up about how the White House has changed his sister on this special inauguration edition of today, right after this. Welcome back to this special inauguration day edition of today. Willie Geist had a chance to speak with a key member of the president's family over the weekend, his brother-in-law, Craig Robinson. Willie, good morning again to you. Savannah, good to see you again this morning. Yeah, Craig Robinson is in a unique position. He is the brother of the First Lady, the brother-in-law of the President of the United States. He's also, by the way, the head basketball coach at Oregon State University. Flew in from a game in L.A. Saturday night here for the festivities. I got a chance to talk to him about politics and about what happens when your family becomes the first family. The first time was such a blur. There's an election. My brother-in-law wins. There's an inauguration. My family moved into the White House. and. Uh, I cannot remember anything from that one. So I'm hoping this time around I can soak it in a little bit more. Your sister's been in this White House for four years. Do you feel like it's changed her? I think it has for the better. You would be amazed at the number of people who come up to me because I have this face and I look like my sister and they are so excited about what she's doing, what they're doing to help this country. Do you allow yourself sometimes to sit back, maybe you're at home on TV and you see your brother-in-law addressing the nation and say, that's the guy I knew 20 <laughs> years ago running around our house. Could that be the same guy? <laughs> Albeit with a little bit whiter hair. Yeah, uh, a little bit. Yeah, no, you, to see the president doing what he does on a daily basis, uh, whether it's on television, in the newspaper. It just reminds me of how it's possible in this country for a regular guy to get elected president. You've played a lot of basketball with the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. As a coach, how do you evaluate his game? Well, it's easy. He's uh, definitely a team player, and he never tried to act like he was any different of a player than he normally was. That's a, that's a real character trait. So is he a scorer or a distributor? Well, he started out a scorer, and as he's gotten older, he's become more of a distributor and shot maker, as we all do. <laughs> <laughs> this happens when this the happens. legs start to go a little that's bit. That's right, right, that's right. How have Sasha and Malia handled life in the White House? We've sort of watched them grow up. Right. They're such gracious girls, and uh, they're just evolving into very nice young ladies. And, you know, by the end of this, Malil being heading to college. I mean, it's just it's just unbelievable to me. Coming from where you came from on the south side of Chicago, what is it like to look up and see your sister standing there on the steps of the United States Capitol as her husband's being sworn in for a second term as yeah. president? What is that feeling? First and foremost, a sense of pride in that uh, that I'm standing up there watching my family members. It, there, there's a sense of humility. There's a sense of honor. Um, and, and above all, there's a sense of family. Craig Robinson will be here soaking this up, Savannah, but he did say he's already been watching game tape today and last night for their game against Washington this week. So he is here, but he's thinking about basketball back in Corvallis, <laughs> Oregon, Savannah. Oh, he's got to multitask a little bit. Willie, thanks so much. Still ahead, the intense security surrounding this inauguration and what the First Lady has done for fashion in this country right after this.